Okay. All right. Floor two. Floor two. Here we go. inserted into the middle of the exhibition sort of as, I guess, a palette cleanser or a moment to breathe. Um, but I can't get a moment to breathe. I know, especially the take the stairs. Um, but also as a way to give people a, a little bit more of a sense of Clark's process and then for those who really want to take a deep dive into some of the math and science behind the pattern mystic phenomena that um, are represented in some of Clark's paintings. It, this kind of is a little very superficial introduction to that that might give people enough that they could um, go home and do some more Googling. Well, that's that. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so uh, the, the sketches are grouped just really by kind of visual um, connection. Um, but they give a sense of how a copper works and how methodically um, and some of the structures that underlie the overall structure of the paintings. And one of the most important structures that Clark has been working with now for decades is the Penrose tile, um, which is the same pattern, or in fact, it's not exactly the pattern, um, as the quasi-crystal, which is a semi-crystalline uh, structure that um, was discovered at first in the lab, but now has been discovered in but what's funny about it is, um, and, and this is a great place to show people what the kind of core uh, structure of that is, you can see um, here that there are what, what Clark likes to call skinny and fat rhombi. Um, so here is, a, like, uh, this is a skinny, Mm -hmm. and then this is the fat, mm -hmm. and then there are kind of larger, you can actually sketch them out, like here's a good example, there are skinny and fat run by within this structure, but then here is a... Okay, but there one. are only two run by that looks like. Yes, that's okay, the, but, kind but, of the core okay, yeah. of uh, Penrose tiling, mm -hmm. there are just two. Clark has, start, has extrapolated beyond that, and really? made... Yes, with um, <laughs> you guys. Know, oh, it's I'm crazy. Looking at you, this can see, okay. you can see here. This is a good illustration of their three um, oh. types. There's this is like medium, fat, and skinny, skinny. Um, and so there are ways of kind of extrapolating beyond just the basic Penrose tiling. Um, and then you can see in all of these sketches. Um, depending on kind of how your eye is focusing, you can see the suggestion of a three-dimensional shape, uh, mostly completely. because yeah. of shading. Like here, yeah. you know, that's where computers help because mm -hmm. they kind of intuit um, and often apply color to shapes as you're creating them. Um, and so uh, it, in doing so, basically suggest depth, um, like with this lighter shade of red and a darker shade of red, mm -hmm. um, you get that suggestion of dimensionality. Um, so this basic composition has been at the core of Clark's work for the past four decades. Um, and really, he has, ever since discovering this, Clark has been kind of uh, expanding upon it um, and embedding it into his work. It's amazing, because it's, it's, it's like actually, as he adds complexity, he's still Add, able to add even additional detail and color, and it's Absolutely. it's like an exponential increase in complexity is what's happening. Totally, for the and, and just for the kind of viewer in terms of what there is to look at, yeah. um, the kind of just simple beauty of the shape and the colors, but then also there's added complexity in terms of the number of dimensions mm -hmm. that are referred to mm -hmm. or re represented, um, yeah. and so that's the significance of the quasi. Crystalline pattern of uh, the rose tile is that they are um, a two dimensional representation of higher dimensionality. Amazing. Yes. Uh, and so this installation, which runs the full vertical length of the building, uh, is a call out to a work that was installed. It's in the museum's fire lane or alleyway. 
uh, which is just to the south of the building. Uh, the museum, as you know, um, does not have a permanent collection, but we do have a handful of works that are permanently installed on site. Mm -hmm. And when the, this building was opened in 2007, the board commissioned Clark to make a permanent work for the building. And so these green lines are installed forever in our fire lane um, mm -hmm. in dyed concrete. And so this is just kind of a, a call out to that to help people acknowledge it. And what's interesting here is this um, pattern that looks to kind of totally whimsical um, or organic is actually related to, again, that Penrose Tiley. You're saying it's not random. It's not random. No, <laughs> it's all very, and nothing with Clark is random. It's all very well, intentional. And this is also, again, I guess why I really wanted these videos that, um, when is the last day for this exhibition? September 1st. Okay, so um, hopefully you can come out to see this by September 1st. Yes. But I mean, with the video now, I mean, because this will not travel after this. So. It will not travel. There's an exhibition catalog, so yeah. people can kind of live the right, exhibition right. forever by reading the catalog right. um, or by watching the video. Watching the video. That you're so kindly yeah. making for us. I am so honored that you would spend the time with because I'm going to remember this too I do too. <laughs> it's been it's been a privilege to work with Clark. Um, it's you know we so often work with young artists or emerging artists here at MCA, which is a privilege in a totally different way. We get to kind of help artists as they are becoming who they are and their practices becoming what it will be. Um, it's a very different experience and a privilege of a different kind to work with someone who's near the end of their career, um, someone who has a real sense of who they are and what they've accomplished and to kind of help them get to see that. So it's been a, a real key to work with Clark. This is my favorite thing to do. Because I think that these paintings are unlike any other paintings we've ever seen. I think they're, all of Clark's work is unique, but I think these are perhaps the most Unique of everything he's made. Um, I know. I love them because it's as though Clark kind of he's trying to represent something in with geometric abstraction. These ideas about the underlying structure of the world, the universe, and um, through abstraction, I think trying to make them accessible because he does believe the other things cross powers believe that geometric abstraction and pattern are kind of inherently familiar, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they're being used to depict naturally occurring subjects or phenomena, something like the periodic table or a specific element structure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's as though Clark felt like he maybe hit a, a creative block or something and recognized that he wasn't getting through to viewers, or maybe, you know, maybe he just got tired of it, of trying to depict his, depict his subjects in that way, and so he reverted to what is ostensibly a more traditional way of painting space, um, using foreshortening and shadow and linear perspective. Um, and rather than covering the entire surface with an abstraction of a structure or a pattern, he is representing those structures as three-dimensional or two-dimensional objects in space, often putting them on a wall as an artwork or on a pedestal as an art object. Um, and really calling the viewer's attention to the same subjects uh, in a different, almost more obvious way. So, what are you addressing? Because, <laughs> up until this point, right, everything is up, it's been an empty space without life. Mm -hmm. Maybe we saw a little bit of grass, right, in the first one. Yeah. In the, in the first yeah. one. The suggestion of grass. And of course, you live life to the fullest in Drop City. <laughs> but then, everything else around it's all just shapes and colors. Skyline. So now we're talking millions of people. Mm -hmm. No faces, then, but just millions out there. Right. right? It's like well, in a world map. World map. Which is also pulling it out. Yes. I assume that's actually the correct shape. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess you're right. Like the fact that before we did that hyperspace exhibition, we were looking at just um, like what must have been tens of thousands of little squares, just so. Delicately color shaded, mm -hmm. and then you're, and then it's like, it's like one block, <laughs> and the color, it's like a Rubik's cube. It's like yes. I'm gonna give you one step up from Rubik's cube. Yes, totally. Um, to make my point. So what are you trying to say now? 
that we're shallow, that we're what? Is no, it? I don't think it's, you know, I, I think Clark is someone who is so brilliant that um, he maybe has had to kind of give himself challenges in his career, and so uh -huh. this just presented itself, you know, reverting to the depicting space mm -hmm. and using more traditional representational mechanisms or strategies like foreshortening and 3D perspective using simpler forms, just like a basic sphere and a basic cube. Yeah, I'm not like cross trees. There are definitely abstractions of trees. Yeah, um, but um, I think that he, you know, I've, I've tried to kind of understand or make sense of this, what I think of as a pretty radical shift in his practice mm -hmm. um, to making his pictorial works. I've tried to make sense of it in so many different ways. And I think that it's, um, but the way that I do really, uh, I've come to really understand it is that he's um, trying to reach viewers in a different way and trying to depict in maybe a, a different or more accessible way the same subjects because he believes in their importance. He believes that it's important for us to understand the logic of something like a Rubik's Cube or a Magic Cube. Um, and the world map, as Buckminster Fuller designed it. This is called, he called it the Dynaxian map. Again, this is the trust that Fuller believes is the fundamental building model for the universe. Um, and so kind of giving us a sense of these um, basic structures or um, apparatuses that different people have used to make sense of the universe and the world as we see it. This one makes me feel very vulnerable, you know, Ooh. because I'm looking at this floor, um, and because uh, the city seems so distant, and somehow in my eyes, like I focus on that little lane right there, yeah. and it kind of creates this depth, like of about 12 inches above the real floor. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think I'm actually going to find my high rise or my ground level actually. And so it's, Absolutely. And it's, it's like it's like saying like you think you're on the top of the world, but maybe you're at the ground level and you're on yeah. this thing. Um, it's so powerful. It is, and when I think it's um, you know Clark paints a few works with human figures in them. Yeah. But in general, the spaces that he painted are vacant, mm -hmm. and I think that that really does lead the viewer to kind of reconcile the sort of place. Vis -a -vis so the the space that he's created, mm -hmm. um, and especially with this work, because there is this, like you were saying, this implication of human existence, with Denver and the world map, um, and this thing called the geoscope, which is another Fullerian invention. Um, so there is this, you know, implication that or presumption of a human presence, um, and obviously mm -hmm. the scale of the painting. And the way that the, the image extends off of the two canvases, it does really place us into this space. Yeah. But we don't know what our responsibility right. is. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it's just these paintings really are just another attempt to kind of present this information that Clark sees as being fundamentally important mm -hmm. to understanding the world. Um, and so many of the references that the paintings make are mathematical or scientific. Um, as an art historian, I love this one because the shapes and um, the symbols that are included are references to art history. And so it feels like this kind of gives me a little bit more of a handhold to enter into painting. Um, so Clark uh, learned about Black Mountain College, which was this um, kind of incredible utopic place for learning and experimentation in art in North Carolina and Black Hills um, that was founded in large part by really refugees of the Bauhaus Academy in World War II. Um, and it ended up becoming a hub for many of who we now think of as the most important American artists in the 20th century, um, including Buckminster Fuller. Um, and I think that Black Mountain College was to some degree a model for the droppers when they come to Drop City. Um, and I think it's continued to be an inspiration for Clark um, in his teaching, certainly. It was very much understood at Black Mountain that the teachers were students and the students were teachers. 
Um, and that's definitely uh, an ethos that Clark has embodied and practiced himself as an instructor. But um, the different objects you see kind of floating in front of this landscape, but this is the kind of um, quintessential view of Black Mountain that was and still is included usually as a photograph um, in our history textbooks. Uh, and exhibition catalogs, but then the rest of these are um, symbols, are representations of specific artists who were at, at Black Mountain, whom Clark feels a real affinity with or was inspired by. So this is a representation of a model of the atom that an artist named Kenneth Snelson created. Mm -hmm. And this down here is meant to be specifically the red lines are meant to well, represent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and the red lines are meant to resemble a John Cage score. This is supposed to be a reference to Robert Rauschenberg's white painting. This is an homage to Joseph Albers. Um, this is supposed to be kind of the prototype of Fuller's geodesic dome. This is an abstraction of the Black Mountain logo. That's an abstraction of the Bauhaus logo. And this is the Octet Trust, again, another homage to Fuller. So this is a tribute here. Yes. Yes. yes, which I um, I love, and I, I also think it's great because it, like a couple of other paintings Clark has made that are these like art historical tribute paintings, mm -hmm. um, it demonstrates the depth of his reverence and knowledge of art history it, as being equal to his interest in math and science. I mean, what a great compliment to yes. these, uh, his, his colleagues. Totally. And his inspirations. Yeah. And, absolutely. And I think they're great because they kind of, um, more than the other paintings, demonstrate what a great painter he is. Mm -hmm. um, and the way he is able to kind of almost have fun as a painter, mm -hmm. emulating other artists in her work. Mm -hmm. So nice. Thank you. Yeah, so this is... We don't want to leave any stone okay. on the yeah, yeah, exactly. So, like, it was, I said, <laughs> Clark, is, this, these kind of art historical homage paintings, um, art tribute paintings, demonstrate in part what a great painter he is. And so this painting is um, an extrapolation of this art cube I mentioned earlier. He's painted this diagram in multiple iterations throughout uh, mm. his career and has sketched it many times too. It's this basic binary diagram that he has filled in with art historical terminology and he fills it in with different specific terms in each instance. Um, so here you see the basic, there's expression and construction and then he goes up to abstract representation and, and it gets down further and further. He can't tell me why he used flower names here for the next mm -hmm. level, um, but then at the very bottom are specific artists' names. So it's kind of his way of categorizing different artists and explaining or making sense of the type of they, type of work that they do and its relationship to the work of other artists. So then each of these artists listed here is represented also by mm. an artwork in this space. Um, so here we have a Rauschenberg, or sorry, not a Rauschenberg, Rothko, a Diebenkorn, um, Jennifer Bartlett, I believe. Um, mm. This is O'Keefe. There's our, this is our Johns, that's our Judd. Um, yeah, and so, and then again, there's a little reference to Denver, that's the Denver Botanic Gardens. And, and also, this whole schema too reminds me of what he did 15 years ago, mm -hmm. that was on the first floor in hyperspace. Yes. Um, the repetition of the, the dot placement and everything else. I love that he refers back to like a previous era of work even. Totally. Yeah. No, I mean, these, um, there are certain of these types of structures mm -hmm. that appear again and again, and they kind of served at slightly different purposes, um, at least superficially, but ultimately the, the, the fundamental purpose is the same, which is to make sense of information, really, catalog information. So here's the art cube again, with different information this time. Um, and this is kind of a sweet painting as well. This is Robin Rule, who represented Clark for years. Um, she was an early gallery founder in Denver. The gallery still exists. She's no longer alive. Were they more um, than friends? 
You know, I don't think they were. Mm -hmm. um, Clark's second wife, Barbara, appears in oh, one okay. of his other paintings that's in the show. Um, but no, I think that she was just a great friend and supporter. Yes, it is named, and the, the spelling of melancholia is what we think of being incorrect. Um, it's a reference to, I believe, Al an Albert Durer oh, okay. print, um, and his spelling of melancholia. These paintings actually come between the crisscross paintings that we were looking at earlier and the pictorial paintings. Um, but I included them here because I think they're a great bridge between the pictorial and purely geometric abstract work. Um, and in the flow of the exhibition, we're moving back from the pictorialism to geometric abstraction in the next gallery. And I think that they, they function really well that way because they're like the crisscross paintings and that the background is this complex pattern that's really just a big abstract geometric mm -hmm. field. But then later in that period, Clark started creating these insets mm -hmm. where he would depict kind of the core unit. It sounds like a magnification, yes, right? Yes, exactly. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like, like from a textbook. Picture, picture. Yes, it's like a textbook. It's like, I here's what it. this looks like yeah, yeah. And under a regular microscope, and then this is like the superpower microscopic view. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate it as a viewer because I think it helps my eyes, especially with the later crisscross works that got really complex like these, um, it helps kind of give your eye a little, um, I don't know, it's like a key, basically, in a map or something. I agree. And yeah. it's, I see this is 1986, mm -hmm. and the crisscross is 68. Is he the type of guy to be a numerologist and choose this year to bring back some of the <laughs> I don't think he was that intentional. And also, Clark <laughs> is a very slow painter. Um, <laughs> really? I say that with much respect. I'm not uh, a painter at all. And yeah. also, if I made paintings like this, I would be slow too. Um, so it's, I think that the, the years or the, the, the dates um, are simply the dates on which he finished okay. them or on which Robin Rule came into the studio and said, you want an opening done, tonight? Yeah. This is done. You're they really are. I get so lost in them, and especially with the colors. The nice thing about providing that magnification feature, right? Usually the idea is you want to look at it in finer detail. Mm -hmm. And so even the whole concept that there's more to see, you know, like he's, he's almost telling you. He's, yes, he's, he's telling us. Come in. Yes, yeah, like yeah. please, totally come in. Yeah, come in. Yes, I love that. I love this. I, this is uh, one of the very. Yes, please. Okay. Which I think just looks like it was made for this wall. Um, in fact, so it was, it was commissioned by what's now known as Colorado Creative Industries. It's the state public art entity, basically state-funded public art commissioning body. Um, they commissioned this in the late 80s for Colorado State University, and it was installed in the chemical engineering department uh, in an old brutalist at the time of you a brutalist building on CSU's campus um, in a not particularly prominent place. <laughs> in what? fact, it was in, I know, I know. Um, Please tell me it was a well lit. No, it was poorly lit with fluorescent lights, and the ceiling was low, it was hung very close to the ground, and the, I think the hallway and its width barely met ADA requirements. Um, it was a, so you couldn't really get, you couldn't really stand back to do it. <laughs> Um, I believe it was 1987. And this building was put up in 2009? Was that 2000, right? 2007? For what? This building opened 2007? Yeah. A little yeah. Years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It, it was made for was, this exhibition. I know. Let's walk on. If we, if we had a collection, um, I would be campaigning hard with the board to acquire this baby. I, um, so where will it go after this? It's going back to CSU. They have promised us that it's not, the same. not going to go back to the same dark hallway. In fact, I think that building that it was in is scheduled to be uh, demoed and replaced. It's going back to a behavioral sciences building. Um, and I hope that the behavioral scientists, uh, their, their students are a bit more um, respectful of the painting. When I drove up to Fort Collins last summer to find this, Clark hadn't seen it since he installed it. I know. It's breath and I love it. It's the horizon of that. I, mean, I know. Even just, and just yeah. walking yeah. with 
kind of looking that, at, yeah. the, at the horizon. Um, but students had painted smiley faces onto every Shady. yellow dot, most of the orange dots, so plenty is of the that dots. Where, is that the restoration? Yeah, so done, we or? found a great painting conservator who oh spent a long time very lovingly restoring this uh, yes. to its former glory. But I love it. I mean, it's so, look at you, when you get up close, again, you see that, you know, when you're looking out from far away, you understand that there is this kind of receding, infinite space. But when you get up close and look at it, you can appreciate that it's just this series of circles painted at different, and that there's this super subtle treatment of paint. Um, and what's so amazing about it, right, it's the, it's the, it's the simplicity that creates this complexity, right? And, yes. And that's where you're like, that's where anyone gets to appreciate the genius of it. Totally. And I can only imagine, like, every dot that he's painting, like, how much love do you put into this artwork? I oh, mean, yeah. Every well, circle especially the super, times, like, super like, pale ones. ones. Yeah. I think, like, how careful did he have to be to get the, like, the paint color just right to create the effect that he wanted. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a pretty special painting. Um, so yeah, it's going back to CSU, um, and they have promised that they will treat it with love. Otherwise, you have to steal it. And then they will light it better. Or else, I'll take you all. You want to go boost this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. Okay. Um, that hair is really and then here you're coming up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these paintings are all. Painted within the past couple of years, um, and again that goes up the line structure of the Earth's highlighting um, and that implication of higher dimensional space uh, with really again yeah, flat surface, this you know two dimensional pattern that suggests what look like three dimensional objects depending on how you view them, but really. five and ten dimensions specifically. The colors are amazing because um, on opening night when you first intro this piece with Clark, it was dark out. And That's actually you couldn't see anything. <laughs> but it's so loud too. Um, <laughs> I know it was actually some of us in the background like making some chatter. <laughs> oh it's you. Oh, okay. Well maybe. Okay. Right. <laughs> yourself. But so when the art hotel in town opened. Um, it's in their collection. And it's all oh, just the one left, the art hotel. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, now um, I know where it's been more Now you can go see it more often. Okay. Clark is very happy to have it installed here because the two panels actually abut. The way they've installed it there, the two panels don't touch. And it's very frustrating to him. Can you make a suggestion? Yes, I think they might need to. Our hotel is out often brought by my It's a great hotel, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Nice patio and good patio. Oh, that's amazing, yeah. um, but I think that, you know, the, the way I understand this painting and the other paintings in this gallery are that they are, at least to date, kind of the most concise um, or eloquent um, 
synthesis of the ideas that Clark has been playing with throughout his career. I think that they are less overwhelming and less complex than the crisscross paintings in a way that makes them more accessible and more kind of simply beautiful. I think there are some, some of the colors, like the one across the bottom of that are more poppy seeming, which again make them um, feel more familiar. But they also, I think, most poignantly or again, um, concisely uh, consolidate or synthesize that tension between the flat surface of a canvas and then the suggestion of three-dimensional depth, but also that suggestion of higher space. It's almost like in a ball commentary of the world game photo of painting. Of yes, like yes, yes. It's like he simplified it, but almost in an offensive sort of way. Like it could be deemed insulting. Yes. And this one is much more empathic and sympathetic to people who maybe don't appreciate. And totally. it's like it's like saying, listen, I get it. Like now, this is a very inviting way. Like, my brains. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I don't know. Don't, no, I, I think that, that these, yeah. um, I think that these paintings, they tend, this gallery tends to be people's favorite, um, and I think that it's because you're so right that there's something about the color choice and the composition that is more inviting and feels more accessible, um, and they achieve even more than the crisscross paintings did that uh, one of the kind of ideals of crisscross, which was to make these really complex ideas accessible and familiar to people on a basic level through geometric abstraction. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I, I can almost feel this intentionality where you try, it's like it's all I've been trying to reveal through images um, how we move through the world. Yes. And it's like at this stage of clear like this is the summation of everything. So the baby is totally. so better. Right? But I mean if he, uh, yeah. he says he is, right. but I don't know how you get much better than this. No, and I think you're so right that it is a summation of and it is kind of like he has continued evolving his practice and pushing. And I love that the different bodies of work within his career are so distinct and that you can see that he's really tried and pushed himself hard to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I think, you know, with each body of work, he's gotten closer to the goal. Yeah. Well, Min, thank you for doing this. It's really fun to get to talk about all the paintings in the show. Give a shout out to Ty. Thank you so much, Ty, for no, thank you for being theater. our videographer. <laughs> <laughs> building is known for being very sensitive to the scale of his buildings to the human body. And Clark de decided early in his career to make mostly square paintings based on his proportions. They are 60 by 60 or 70 by 70 inches. Um, and they're based on what he calls Vitruvian proportions, which is that uh, kind of Dinochi Vitruvian man. Um, and so the dimensions are based on his arm span. And I've heard too uh, from other artists as well, they felt that this museum kind of really showcased their work in the best possible way. Well, and, that's very um, nice to hear. It's <laughs> great. And uh, yeah, what an amazing place. It is. It's a very special place in large part because of the special people involved. Yeah, I'm so, so lucky. You. It's like a great office. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Min. This is great. I love it. I can't wait for everyone to see it. Me too.